everyone, and welcome back to the Overmanga Cast. My name is Sam, and uh, we are Shy a J, so we've got Du Bois here to do a discussion episode. We're uh, we're also Shy a, a thing to read this week, so here we are. <laughs> we're talking about genres, that ever looming specter over any discussion of media. Uh, one of the most useful terms in talking about media, and also one of the most frustrating <laughs> simultaneously it's very helpful and also incredibly unhelpful is dumb mm -hmm. <laughs> uh i think one of the one of the most important things to understand about genre is that it is a generalization it is uh it's something that catches a broad swath of things and there are a lot of things that are very overtly in a specific genre that don't necessarily fall all, follow all of what you would consider the hard and fast rules. Sort of like how the five man band trope can sometimes have four members just because of the nature of the way the series is structured. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know. just and as we've discussed on this show before, uh, Shonen it is so incredibly broad as to encompass wildly different things. and. Uh, so that comes into a bit of our opening point here about what actually makes a genre feel like itself, the tropes and aesthetics that go into it. You know, one of the series that we read, uh, a personal favorite of mine, the series Kaiju number no. eight isn't a Kaiju series. Mm -hmm. You know, it has Kaiju in it. There's not seven others of it. <laughs> but when you think about you know seminal pieces of kaiju media uh it is lacking some of those uh important touchstones things like in um godzilla and uh pacific rim the idea of the kaiju being uh personified forces of nature that man is almost helpless against whereas people really aren't that like, like the kaiju are dangerous in kaiju number eight, but no more so than any other antagonistic force in a shonen. It's sort of a like you have the aesthetic of the giant monsters, but the thing that makes kaiju fiction kaiju fiction is this idea of something so massive that a single person is made insignificant. You know, like there's a mm -hmm. sort of fun twist in Pacific Rim where generally speaking people can't really do much in a in a kaiju story you know they can slightly steer the plot but they're pretty helpless but like you know the jaegers this couple people coming together like the two minds melding sort of thing is sort of a fun twist on the one person alone can't stand against this whereas in a shonen one person alone by default will stand against this impossible task because somebody needs to be the big damn hero with a super cool power up. The important element of genre to me is is something that uh, defines the uh, experience of the audience member. You know, mm -hmm. not just the look of it, but a, a lot of times core themes are are really important. Like themes are usually uh, a big hallmark of genre. Yeah, like one of my personal favorite genres, uh, which we haven't touched too much on in the podcast so i'll keep this brief but it's cosmic horror and for me cosmic horror uh aesthetically is a very wet genre <laughs> but like between the various fishy monsters of lovecraft or the viscera and bloodborne it, it, that is kind of the first step that makes me think okay this is a piece of cosmic horror media that i'm going to uh start viewing through that lens we read uzumaki we did read Uzumaki, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we will get to that uh, a little later on when we're talking about specific examples. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think another good example is I can think of a series that is very wet, has things to do with space and is horror, yet is absolutely not cosmic horror. Uh, Subnautica, mm -hmm. the, the sort of big thing is Subnautica, you can come to understand it. The best part of the Subnautica experience is where you come to understand the creatures and the depths and are able to navigate around them safely, almost mundanely. Which that is literally the diametric opposite of cosmic horror. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, even though looking at something like, say, the sh uh, the Shadow Leviathan, 
could be a Lovecraft monster pretty easily. Um, you know, it doesn't feel that way because it's an animal and you can understand the way it thinks. Getting back into the space of what we talked about, uh, of what we've talked about on our show, Golden Kamui uh, is uh, Western. Uh, it, it has a lot of the trappings of a Western, you know, frontier towns, a sort of feel of high lethality, uh, even though our characters will, you know, improb- uh, survive in improbable situations quite often. Well, the main that's the main character's gimmick. Mm, that is the main character's gimmick. There's also uh, there's also the aspect of law by the gun, which is uh, mm-hmm. very Western. Everyone else dies in one bullet. Main character gets shot seven times. <laughs> <laughs> yep, right up there with the greats. So uh, that's sort of what uh, we are working off of uh, thinking about uh, genre in terms of aesthetics. The tropes are, I feel a little less specific. Like, sure, there's tropes that you wouldn't use in certain genres, but also just by their nature as a tool it's not impossible like the the eponymous romance subplot that can fit in a wide variety of media even ones where you think why do we why would we ever have time for romance in this yeah like a a sort of good uh like feel for um what makes a genre feel like a genre is the first layer is the aesthetic Does it look like the thing? The next layer down is use of tropes that are common in that genre. Um, Those are like symptoms of it being a genre. And I think the the layer beneath that is, you know, genres have uses in telling a story. There's a reason why you don't just set it in a real mundane world. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's just because it's cool, to be fair. But, you know, you know, thinking about it from like a like a story making perspective, there are reasons why you choose that. And, you know, you know, the themes of, you know, the smallness of uh, actually, funnily enough, uh, the two examples we gave of cosmic horror and uh, uh, the kaiju genre, uh, you know, that that idea of smallness that it instills in uh, the experiencer of that pe- uh, piece of media, you know, that's a, uh, you know, that's like like that's a core theme that is common throughout that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, do you have any uh, thoughts in this particular vein? Not particularly. Well, all right, then with our preamble out of the way, shall we get into some uh, specific examples uh, taking from our roster? Uh, works for me. All right. So uh, we're opening up with a, a good compare and contrast and showing uh, the broadness of genre uh and talking about sci-fi uh eden zero and gundam crossbone two things that could not be for, on further ends of the spectrum and yet somehow remain within the same technically the same genre yeah this mm-hmm. is this is very much the case where subgenre is a thing and i think it's fair to call both of them science fiction because if you're looking for a certain kind of story you can get that certain kind of story through both of them. But the way that they tackle that is completely different and their goals are completely different. The Mobile Suit Gundam franchise is generally speaking uh, uh, a very grounded, very hard sci-fi. It has some, uh, you know, use the Force Luke moments with its new types and such. But like generally speaking, you know, it's like propellant tanks and and oxygen and water are major factors. Uh, if you're out, if you're in space without a normal suit, you are very dead. Specifically in uh, Gundam Crossbone, the logistics of space living are a front and center part of the motivation of most of the primary cast. Particularly the antagonists, but really everybody. There's this aspect of it's hard to live in space and that creates conflict, which is also where the idea of new types come from. It's hard to live in space, so people have to change to adapt to space. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd say Crossbone in particular, though, felt a little more pulp. Yeah, it's it's more pulpy than a lot of other Gundam. Because if we remember, I believe in that same vein where they're like, oh, no, our supplies are so living in space is nothing but constant super communism dwarfing our supplies. Also, here's a diner where you can buy American cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> here's a shower. Here's two shower scenes with the main character. Is it water rationed? No. <laughs> you know, that that sort of pulp aspect, you know, drawing from other uh, genres. 
even as much as I like Crossbone, there are also cases where genre can work against a, a, a story. Uh, we'll we'll get into that in a bit more detail a bit later. But, you know, like mm-hmm. there are elements of uh, Gundam villains kind of have to be extra. Uh, it's it's sort <laughs> I mean, of how I mean, there's space Nazis. They're going to be extremely overbearing in yeah. that regard. And I mean, like it's it's done in service of something where uh, it it kind of justifies having the uh, philosophical debates while you're shooting lasers at each other in in space robots. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know there is that that aspect of like how cartoonishly evil uh, the main villain of Crossbone is, where he's literally in a giant tank of water when his people are dying of thirst. You Just know the I, most Bond villain looking ass. Yeah, it, like if you're if you're in the Gundam headspace, it works. But like if you're not in a Gundam headspace, it can kind of take you out of the otherwise particularly hard sci fi. This is uh, kind of where we move over towards uh, Eden Zero, which is uh, a very soft sci fi talking about subgenres. Heck, I would qualify it as a science fantasy. Yeah, in most regards. I, I would say it's just fantasy like it. It wears the science of it as if science is another type of magic. Like, yeah, yeah, quite literally in uh, in one case with Professor Wise. Yeah. And um, like the sort of the fun bit about Eden Zero is it is like the fullest and furthest expression of that uh like that idea that was introduced in in science fiction i don't remember by who but there's a really famous quote of any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic um and i mean of course i of course need to now bring up metroid because how do we (laughs) explain anything in that franchise anything this the power suit can do bird Bird magic magic. (laughs) jozo just figured it out that sort of like blends in with uh another aspect of uh, it's like, what do genres do? Because, um, you know, Eden Zero being at once one of those cases of it's like it's the aesthetic of sci fi. But science fantasy is a fantasy series with a, you know, science code of paint. The value of the fantasy genre, you know, science or otherwise, is it allows you it, it allows the audience to simply accept the supernatural. My, the main character has gravity powers. Because of this piece of technology that is so advanced, it's indistinguishable from magic. Cool. Moving on. You know, you don't have to explain the how how the neutrinos move or whatever. As why opposed, get, why why did this cat get run over by a car and now turns into robots? Yeah, uh, turns into it, guns. Tur- turns into guns. Science magic. I'm, um, you can also just say magic is the thing. Well, yeah, yeah. And and that's sort of the thing where like science fantasy does d- double duty as it something that's definitively science fantasy leans more on the fantasy than the science. Whereas if you look at something that's hard sci fi, there's sort of like a an aspirational aspect of uh, almost a puzzle solving aspect in a lot of cases. You know, how, how do you work with the limiting factors of reality and physics even with this wonder technology that is usually at the core of any science fiction series you know you have the monovsky particles and gundam um you know you have the hyperdrive technology in star wars we're definitely doing a star wars manga at some point well that's kind of the thing is like that's the main difference between like as genres the difference between fantasy and sci-fi is that fantasy is about like an unexplored world and like adventure whereas sci-fi is more about like the human condition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's why Star Wars is not a great science fiction movie because it, it doesn't care. It's about showing you brave new worlds. Well, that that's actually sort of the funny thing because the original Star Wars movie is is surprisingly hard and it's sci-fi. It's just every single else other piece of Star Wars media ever is straight science <laughs> fantasy. Mm-hmm. Except like, they made that blunderous error of using... um parsecs to refer to time. <laughs> i hope someone was fired for such a blunder of course of course <laughs> how could they allow such a mistake to be put on screen excuse me sam why would a man whose t-shirt say genius at work be watching a children's movie <laughs> uh. so yeah star wars is bad let's move on <laughs> <laughs> Aww. moving on 
uh, we've got something completely different. We've got a really powerful example here of the length and breadth of uh, genre. Uh, Kaguya-sama, in order to talk about uh, comedy. Because there is a lot to explore there in terms of the the romance aspect of it, but looking at it specifically as a comedy manga manages to incorporate a lot of different ways of telling jokes. Like, of course, it all comes down to the uh, the basic idea of two people just refusing to communicate with each other. <laughs> well, it what Kaguya-sama does so well is it's a romance manga, except the like comedic timing for it is this is like a this is a meat cute that would work if these were normal characters. But the problem mm-hmm. is they're both egotistical people that need to win every confrontation. They turn what should just be a cute happenstance into a battle and that like opposed feeling you're expecting and not being there is what brings the comedy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that sort of uh, goes into an important element of comedy as a genre, because, you know, comedy is one of those genres that's very, very broad. Like there like there are so many subgenres to comedy. Um, you know, like the rom-com is one of those many genres. And one of the things that um, uh, comedy can do is it introduces a level of absurdism to the story. Because part of the joke is, why would any reasonable person think this way? They're not why reasonable would, people. Why would you go that far? You know, I mean, like mm-hmm. even looking back at uh, a little bit at Eden Zero, because it can uh, it derives a lot of its comedy from this idea of absurdism. Uh, you know, it's like if if this is a series that's actively trying to make you laugh as part of its core enjoyment, you know, because it's like I, I feel that most series should have moments of levity because even if it's a even if it's a tragedy, having moments of levity to show you what's being lost in the tragedy, I feel makes the sadness deeper. But like there are some things that are like definitively comedies. Like obviously Kaguya-sama is definitively a comedy. That's like a core, like you go to it for the funny. It, it And because you go to it for the funny, like if Kaguya-sama, like, like in some upside down world where Kaguya-sama was supposed to be uh, taken seriously, the character's motivations would be infuriating. But because, oh, yeah. it's, a, but because it's a comedy, that actually heightens the enjoyment. It, it plays off of, and this is a, another strength of the comedy genre. It plays off of one of the inherent aspects of storytelling, which is the willing suspension of disbelief. Yeah, because, you know, the, what person would act like this? What person would act like this? Being able to just cast aside any worries that you might have about, you know, can uh one, uh, I don't want to say consistency of character because one of the fun things about Kaguya is the characters are very consistent and have very <laughs> aggressively very, consistent <laughs> and and have uh and have very well defined through lines in their character arcs and <laughs> and that just makes it even funnier uh because you can just watch the train wreck continue to happen uh the absurdism is important because uh this also allows Kaguya Sama to play with a lot of the uh with a lot of common tropes in manga, such as the absurdly powerful student council. And the setting works even better to that because it's full of people who's who individually and as and with their uh, extended families have more money and influence than God himself. Uh, so that facilitates the over the top uh, situations that already uh, push towards the comedy. And then you just. Yeah, spice that up with some uh, fun, consistent character writing, and it makes for a extremely solid example of the genre. I think that's actually another uh, like sort of point that's worth touching on is you know like different genres have different strengths relative to how they approach storytelling. A comedy doesn't really care about its continuity the way a, a hard sci-fi would. Mm-hmm. A science fiction series, like if it's not consistent, that's a mistake. Whereas a comedy, a comedy will la- will actively and aggressively lampshade an inconsistency, and that can be the intention, you know. And it, it's really more important that the characters have, you know, consistent personality. You know, I mean, like a lot of comedy characters don't like like they go through arcs, but not as severe arcs as as other genres. You know, in genres where you're supposed to like um, threatened for the character's safety or something like that. You know, like a drama, a horror. Uh, hard sci-fi something like that a fantasy series 
some of the best character arcs are when a character at the beginning of the story is one way. They seem like a completely different person by the end of the story, but you see how they got from point A to point B. Those are some of the most engaging characters that exist. Alternatively, in a comedy, comedy characters can absolutely have really great arcs. But generally speaking, they don't change. They don't have to change that much because it's the you know, in a lot of cases, it's the fact that they refuse to change. Like in Kaguya Sama, it's the fact that they refuse to change. If either one if of you- those two idiots would just relax for 45 seconds, <laughs> the story would be over. <laughs> There would not be a manga, yeah. <laughs> and and that's part of the whole point of it. Speaking of absurd situations and subgenres in this regard, the harem manga. <laughs> how did this proliferate so much? I, I know how it did. I know how it did. Horny teenagers is how, but still. <laughs> yes, yes. Wish fulfillment. Keeping in a in a vein like uh, comedy, uh, the hundred girlfriends you really, 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 really at infinitum love you is an example of, uh, you know, the characters who ref- are just their one archetype and do not change. And the the bit that keeps you reading is the fact that, all right, we've got another person with a <laughs> very, very absurd view on life, a weird outlook. And uh, I wonder how this is going to explode when introduced into the soup of the rest of them. That's a bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, two things. One, I don't think I've ever heard of a harem series that isn't also a comedy. Mm hmm. Sure, it exists. I, I would love to see how someone tried to do that and the train wreck that would follow. I think a few different things have had have been spiced with Harem. It hasn't been like the focus. Like, this isn't something that we read, but uh, which from Mercury comes to mind? Shattuck and his girls. <laughs> well, yeah. And I mean, the fact that the main character, everyone proposes to her at some point. <laughs> so next life as a villainous. The harem isn't actually the comedy of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is actually like more. I, I hesitate to say earnest character drama, but well, it's it's melodrama. But yeah, yeah, it, it's very melodramatic. It, it, the comedy comes from, again, the the one character flaw that just will not stop. And that is the fact that the main character is a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, Actually, that, that's sort of um, the other the other thing that I thought of when when you were talking about it is one of the sort of important things as an element of the harem genre is by default, you're going to have a cast of thousands because you have the main character and then you have to have a bunch of romantic interests. Mm-hmm. When you have that many characters, it's hard to focus on. It's hard to give a lot of depth to a lot of them. 100 Girlfriends is the kind of harem series that it's like, OK, this is a weakness of the genre. Screw it all in. They're all caricatures. Mm-hmm. You understand everything you need to about them by the end of their introduction chapter. Yeah. And I mean, like, it, it's sort of funny because uh, uh, Villainess, uh, it has a smaller cast than a lot of other uh, harem series. So it it can afford to get a, a little bit more into detail with the characters and their interpersonal relationships. But, you know, I, I can't help but think of uh, series. Um, we haven't covered either of these yet. We might at some point uh, let us know if you want to uh, hear our opinions on uh, Negima or Love Hina. But like, you know, there's a sort of older, you know, swath of harem manga. What it basically amounts to is that there's like there's the main character. There's like one, maybe two major love interests and then a bunch of side characters. Mm-hmm. Which is exemplified in Hunter Girlfriends by I forget their names, Big Tit Girl and Flat Sundere. <laughs> and uh, in the other harem we did recently, Monster Musume with uh, Mia and uh, actually Mia is kind of the main one in that regard. Yeah, that one. That one's that, sort that, of interesting. That one has a better balance in that regard yeah uh, honestly manmu is one of the most frustrating series we did because i don't want to read it again and yet it honestly seemed like it was trying to be decent it was trying to write a story that actually worked which eh, Mm -hmm. debatable whether you should do that in a harem series i just like how uh 
that manga seemed to have so much bureaucratic incompetence as to have this one man be responsible for so many monster girls, and yet somehow also the efficiency to continue to expand his house into a McMansion that they could accommodate all of them. There's that absurdism again. Indeed. One of the big things about uh, the harem genre is wish fulfillment. And since we're talking about wish fulfillment, how about we get to everybody's favorite? The isekai. Yeah, the um, the committee decided that everyone's uh, individuality was going to be isekais this season again. <laughs> Other than First Life as a Villainess, we haven't done much in the way of like straight isekais. You know, uh, MC Kun gets truck kunned and is then in another world. But we've had a lot of things that uh, are the I can't believe it's not isekai like Tokyo Revengers and well, I mean, Final Girl was, you know, the, the die and reincarnate somewhere else. Here's the funny thing about isekais, because isekais are actually a lot older than people give them credit for. Um, everyone thinks of SAO and all of its 12 quadrillion clones when you say isekai. I mean, uh, the idea of being t uh, taken to another me uh, mystical world is as old as rhyme. <laughs> Literally a Mark Twain novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I i think it's uh it's uh at least two shakespeare plays there are older uh isekai anime it's sort of funny that isekai used to be a genre that was mainly geared towards it used to be a shoujo genre it's, yeah because uh, i can't help but think of escaflone as as what was once the um the quintessential isekai uh that's, that's not true anymore <laughs> And that's got everything. Uh, reincarnated in another world, Mecca, pretty boys. Honestly, 10 out of 10. <laughs> uh, I do love Escaflone. There is, like, conceptually, I love Isekai. There are a lot of garbage Isekai out there that makes it hard to just earnestly love the genre. But there's one element of Isekai that I love, and it's, it's one of those cases where, you know, like, it, it shows the power of genre. Because... Uh, it's sort of funny because my next life as a villainess is actually the only uh, isekai that we've done because we've done we've done three that are pretty definitively at least isekai adjacent. And the only one that really does this uh, sort of thing in uh, like like sort of unlocks the power of isekai, as it were, is villainess, where if you use isekai as a element, you are getting free and instant exposition for your audience. You don't have to do like like you don't have to do text block narrations explaining how the world works. There's a character who knows as little about the world as uh, the audience does, who's stepping into this world and has to have things explained to them that can then be explained. You know, they, that explanation then carries over to the audience. I mm -hmm. mean, just say that. But then most isekai decide to use that like narrative element to be like ah yes we're in the land of fantasy landia where the evil king lives on his four grid square also we have orcs and elves and the elves are hot women i love conceptually the idea behind the isekai but it's hard to like actual isekai stories that exist because in a lot of cases it's just used uh, as a lazy shortcut to world building, you know, and then the other problem is, and this is a really common problem that isekais run face first into. And fortunately, I'd say that the three that we did didn't have this problem. And in fact, they showed why it's a pitfall to avoid, but not inevitable. If you have the uh, protagonist be there to get expositioned at, it can kind of, it can kind of, you know surgically strip them of personality a lot of the times the reason why isekai protagonists get uh uh bad raps is wet blankets is because when you combine so aggressively bland when you uh combine elements of the harem genre which often gets tied to isekai genre elements of isekai you have a cast of thousands so you can't spend a lot as much time on each individual character even the main character, and if a character is spending a lot of their screen time getting expositioned at, where's the personality? Actually, come to think of it, Kill Six Billion Demons is also kind of an isekai, isn't it? It is expressly an isekai. <laughs> In fact, one of the universal complaints the cast had, myself uh, noted Abaddon Stan agreeing with, is that... Um, we do have the exposition te uh, text dump in part one or in book one where uh, 
white chain just sits Allison down for coffee and is like, okay, here's how God works. Yeah, I think the thing that in particular made book two work so well, it's a fair criticism of book one. But I think one of the things that really helped in book two is the fact that people tried expositioning at Allison in book two. And she just said, I don't care. I'm just going to walk over here now. And it's like, that is a very character defining moment, you know, Mm -hmm. using that element of the character not understanding the world to inform their personality, you know, is again, that so oft untapped potential of isekai. Obviously, isekai is always good all the time, and and nobody on the uh, cast has any reason to disagree with that, right? No, it's just stupid (laughs) wish fulfillment. That's the same (laughs) plot nine times out of ten. And I can guarantee when it's different, within four chapters, it will converge into the same pointless meandering bullshit that all isekais eventually turn into. (laughs) Tell us how you really feel, Matt. We already achieved the one useful, interesting part, or my character has an interesting character quirk. Well, our character arc's done. Better meander to world domination, I guess? I don't know. Uh, There's a reason why we compared uh, the very much so not Isekai High School of the Dead to an Isekai. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It is depressingly apt. High School Uh, of the Dead is also bad, though. (laughs) That is the biggest example at least personally on this show of like, wow, I can really tell that a younger me had much better taste. (laughs) It's amazing that I actually found good things (laughs) to enjoy. Uh, Well, that's what the podcast is for. Matt, Matt introduces you to good things. I wouldn't go that far, (laughs) Sam. Hey, there are a few, there, there are a few things from my childhood that are good. Well, so long as we're talking about things that Matt likes. and uh, how, how about some sports manga? Blue Lock, am I right, guys? <laughs> Blue Lock's so good, but it's also barely a sports manga. <laughs> it, tre- it, it treads that fine line because it's a battle royale story. Mm-hmm. It, but it's wearing all of the trappings of a sports manga. It's also like explicitly kind of an anti-sports manga, because typically in sports manga, what a strong defining like thing is, especially in like manga, uh, probably just because of uh, Japanese cultural influence. um, There's a strong message of like teamwork and learning to work together. I say that, but now I'm thinking about it. Most sports movies are also about the power of teamwork. So like, Mm -hmm. meanwhile, Blue Lock is explicitly working as a team. You've got to go out for yourself. If you're not out trying to win personal glory, then you're failing not only the game, but yourself. Yeah, I think I think the thing that a foot of Blue Lock uh, solidly in the uh, sport genre is one of the nice things about sports uh, stories is because it's not inherently life or death, the main characters are capable of failing This is also kind of in the case where Blue Lock is is at once follows the uh, sports uh, genre tropes, but also goes against it because there's a lot of like, uh, you know, if you uh, don't succeed at this, your dreams are dead forever. (laughs) I mean, Um, also, also, it's not like they're winning every single time in Blue Lock, though. They are doing the bare minimum to stay alive. If you set your story in a sports series and don't add some wacky extra twist involving like death or some such nonsense, one of the advantages of uh, a sports story and this is this is something that we called out in uh, Haikyuu. One of the advantages of a sports story is uh, the fact that you can let the protagonists lose, which means, you know, you can you can set up a situation where, you know, you, you're you're trying your best to win, but the protagonists can still lose uh, barely scraping by. But the main character of Blue Lock, uh, you know, not just uh, helping his team win, but like being the linchpin of that victory. Blue Lock also, he has to see like his teammates and like people around him fail. Like there are consequences for his success, which is other people who he presumably cared about have to be left behind. Yeah, there's a real, um, again, as part of that anti-sports uh, sports story message, there's the hardening of the heart to the suffering of others. Or maybe, depending on uh, <laughs> how you look at it, developing a very strong sense of schadenfreude. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I distinctly remember 
uh, from our previous reading of Blue Lock, just him walking up to the guy, collapsed and crying and going, this feels amazing. Blue Lock definitely feels like a sports story almost entirely because it very aggressively and very directly addresses the like the core the core theming and the core appeal of sports stories you know whereas you know there's also something like uh haiku or indeed chihaya furu which plays them almost aggressively straight chihaya mm-hmm. furu is amazing because it's actually the exact opposite it's a single player game <laughs> that they work together as a team with her two boyfriends <laughs> they turn playing uh aggressive solitaire into a sp- into a team sport as a way of doing romantic tension. We read so much of that, and I still don't understand how you play that game as a team. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> and yet, I think it is one of the strengths of Chihaya Furu that it, you don't need to know, which is another sort of subversion of the, of the sports uh, genre, because a sports story has the benefit of um there being a certain level of automatic reader buy-in when it comes to understanding the stakes because one of the broad problems with like any sort of like fantasy or sci-fi is that the save the world story is a little hard to conceptualize but when uh it is this uh core group of characters that you care about have their dreams threatened in a easily understandable uh sport game tournament format that is real easy to just lock yourself into mentally and chihiro furu does all of that without really explaining how to play the damn game <laughs> <laughs> and i think that is a uh, feather in its hat <laughs> yeah personally one of the biggest like aesthetic elements of the sport genre is that idea of the audience basically functioning as a Greek chorus. The reason you can follow what's going on in Chihaya Furu is because you have the character playing, you have their reaction, you have their opponent's reaction to everything going on, and then there's always, you know, whether it's a team game or not, there's always people around watching it play out and reacting to the things that happen. Mm -hmm. That's something that, because sports are played in front of an audience almost always, That's something sort of baked into the DNA where you can the ebb and flow of the story, even if you don't understand the rules. And then, you know, there are certain, you know, it's like in in the case of something like Blue Lock, most people know at least the vague basics of soccer. So and considering Blue Lock never goes anywhere beyond the vague basics of soccer for hilariously over the top reasons, that's all you need. So there's sort of an inherent understanding if the sport is something that's, uh, you know, real and you already know, you know, like you can look up the rules for that matter. Yeah, you do get to kind of co-opt the sideline characters in sports a lot of the time, get their excitement. It it, it helps for uh, readability because it's like, strictly speaking, you can do that in a lot of other different kinds of genres. You know, I mean, like Shonen uses that all the damn time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but like... There, there's sort of an automatic expectation of it in sports, you know, and again, you know, there, there's that idea of, you know, the, the stakes are someone's dreams, which is a thing that, you know, it's like the story can keep going, even if that fails, that makes the stakes feel higher. And also, you know, because it's a public thing. And it's that defined buy-in thing. It's like, okay, the world's at stake. Uh, I guess my stuff is there, so I care about that, but I'm more concerned right now that Goku's getting his ass beat by Vegeta than the fact that the world is in danger, you know? Yeah. And and also there's the fact that in something that has uh, life or death stakes, if the main character loses, they die. Mm-hmm. You know, you can still have drama in, in stories with like life and death stuff going on, uh, even without killing the main character or even any of the uh, supporting characters like that. That can be done. But it's so inherently harder. All right. And any final thoughts about the sports? I want to talk about horror personally. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to start with a bit of a with a bit of a weird parallel in that I think that in a lot of ways, horror effectiveness is very similar to comedy effectiveness because they're both very subjective genres. They're very subjective and they're very timing based, which is one of those Mm. ones where it's like there are there are some cases where 
it genuinely stuns me that you can make a that you can make a horror sequential art book. Yes. Because how do you control the timing? I think that's a consideration that manga and, you know, other sequential art has to make um, because there it uh, there's a certain palpability of dread when it comes to horror stuff like uh, we read Uzumaki. Uh, this is where the strength of page layout is at its greatest, because if you don't want to turn the page to see what has been implied this whole time, it's doing its job. Yeah. Movie horror or visual based horror can utilize stuff like jump scares or or, you know, creative camera angles. And to to a certain extent, uh, you know, framing and camera angles comes into uh, manga as well. But uh, the strength of being able to not make you want to turn the page, but mm -hmm. you also have to because otherwise <laughs> you'll never know. And that's worse. Yeah, we, we've only done one uh, Junji Ito but like that is just an absolute masterclass because like, again, the thing the thing that I, I find so admirable in the sense of, you know, people being able to pull it off is when you're reading a manga, you control how quickly the dialogue plays out, you know, mm -hmm. and so much about so much about horror is, you know, a slow build of tension that snaps at a critical moment. And, you know, things like utilization of the page turn is something that uh, Ito is legendary for, quite rightly. In all honesty, as much as as much as a lot of that stuff was really impressive to me, the thing that uh, really got me with Uzumaki was also uh, the like aspects of how the horror affected the characters in the story. There was a lot of stuff where it's like, you could court, you could sort of get into the rhythm of the formula. But then as you see the world deteriorate, it's like all of these things that are happening are having more and more consequences on the world. And that builds a broader tension. A lot of genres started in the written format in, uh, you know, or I suppose the oral format and uh, stroke written format, you know, things like books where if you're reading a book that has the same problem of pacing, but one thing that is a great like place to plumb horror from is, you know, just the nature of the human mind, the human condition. And another series that does an absolute masterful job of delving into the horror of one's own mind was one of my favorites, Glipnir. Mm -hmm. Glipnir does that horror truism of whatever you allow the audience to imagine is going to be scarier than whatever you come up with. It It's the same sort of thing of trying to prove your main character is so cool. It's just going to make your main character seem so lame. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Gleipnir manages to do something pretty impressive in that it shows a lot of the horrific stuff happening pretty viscerally on panel and yet it still makes you have to you know imagine all the various ways that it is worse uh not for nothing but the the thing that stood out to me with Glipnir the most is uh the female lead uh she's oh, she, she has an american name i uh i don't remember her like like one of the elements of um both showing and telling and, you know, leaving out just enough details, like thinking about how she got to that screwed up place is one of the most genuinely uncomfortable, like things I've seen in. Right. Claire, that was her name. Claire, uh, how she got to the place that she's at, because it's like they tell you a lot. Mm -hmm. But they also don't tell you everything and imagining those in between bits like what caused the inciting incident for example how did and, it get that bad and she's so unpredictable or, or in or the thing is she is very predictable in what she wants to have happen but her methodology just is unknown and that makes it unsettling because you know uh you understand she's capable of anything and what anything can be is anything your own brain can 
throw up. Yeah, that that natural your imagination is going to be worse than showing it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, which isn't always true, because both of these series, one thing that they're both good at. And, you know, it's like, obviously, you know, there there are certain elements of horror where, you know, people can get tired of jump scares. People can get tired of the shock value of some kind of gory on, you know, on screen stroke panel thing. Both Uzumaki and Glipnir use like viscera well because Mm -hmm. they show like they show you the consequences of the bad thing you know Glipnir shows you burning the body for example and you see the snail people that a bunch of the townsfolk turn into in Uzumaki it shows you enough but it also it also leans away from uh giving you every detail and you know the filling in of the gaps um you know i mean like some of the uh, like some of the more horror mo- like you know we mentioned in passing in shonen shoujo some of the ideas of uh uh like that having sort of horror elements to it and you know one of the one of the points of shonen shoujo that uh matt you pointed out was the um uh the element of uh showing something shocking for its own sake doesn't really do anything you know doing it with purpose is important i don't know if this is a personal experience but i find that one of the things that makes horse stick out the most in my own mind is i have this like empathetic reflex when i'm see uh particularly in horror in horror media because horror media is always much more like visceral and in 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 one's face that i see somebody suffering some terrible fate in horror and i can't help but like wonder what it would actually feel like like going entirely out of the realm of manga um and this may seem like a strange example but uh the first tremors movie (laughs) <laughs> there is a scene where an old couple who is only there to be horribly killed by the tremors uh they are driving along in their car the car get, falls into a sinkhole and the the old woman's trying to help pull the old man out of the hole and he's screaming and you can't see what's happening to his lower half in the hole but considering how toothy those monsters are you can only guess and that makes my own like legs tingle with phantom pain. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the, the moment in Gluttonier where uh, Claire controlling main character's uh, mascot body brutalized the legs of uh, Runner Girl. Yeah, similar experience. <laughs> It, it it is sort of interesting because it's like you look at something like like a comedy series, uh, isekai harem, uh, a sports series. Media is designed to give you like like it's supposed to make you happy, you know. Like there there mm. you know there's a reason why there are a lot of happy endings because a lot of uh, a lot of fiction is you know a lot of media is designed to evoke at least by the end positive feelings even if you know there's other emotions to get through to but like horror is one of those genres where it's meant to put you in an in an uncomfortable place so that you have the opportunity to confront uncomfortable emotions in a safe space you know uh the great thing about uh gleitnir and it's we'll say consent metaphor Mm -hmm. you know lack thereof uh is if it ever becomes too much for you you can just close the book put it away and decompress from it you know it but it's meant to make you deeply uncomfortable you're not supposed to be having a as it were traditional good time with it Mm -hmm. what if instead of doing that i just complained about it on twitter well i mean that that would that would make you a basic bit oh wow you'd also be participating in a different form of horror but that's more the existential dread of modern (laughs) living i'd also have to go on twitter (laughs) Yeah, that sounds like a bad time by default. Which is a mistake unto itself, yes. Okay, so this got a little this got a little heavy. Let's take a quick break and we'll be back in a bit to uh, discuss some more lighthearted fare, hopefully. Yeah, I I I kinda wanna go watch Tremors now. Uh, I'll be right back.
And welcome back to the show, folks. And where last we left off our discussion, it was on a bit of a a bit of a dark subject, you know, talking about horror and the various miserable and terrible things that the mind can only dream of such nightmares. So let's talk about something uh, lighthearted and fun. Dark fantasy, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> dark, dark fantasy is a fun one for how it is both like and not like horror. Um, mm -hmm. One of the sort of hallmarks of dark fantasy uh, is like like in horror, almost never can the characters actually fight back. I personally am a fan of when characters in a horror story can actually fight back because uh, I feel there's more tension there than the characters simply getting, you know, insta killed every time, mm -hmm. you know, because then if a character gets Aliens. caught. Uh, yeah, because then if a character gets caught, you know, it's not the end yet. You know, there's that little bit of hope left. Dark fantasy has a lot of the same uh, aesthetic trappings as horror. But like because it's a fantasy world. The characters are capable of obtaining power themselves. Mm -hmm. It's usually not the best thing to do that because <laughs> that just puts you in more danger. <laughs> Uh, again, talking about the broad scope of genre, two of the things that we have discussed in the dark fantasy spectrum were Berserk and the Elden Ring manga. <laughs> it is it is uh, really funny that this is another case where uh, you have something that is uh, overtly that genre because it lives and breeds. And in Berserk's case, for a lot of uh, particularly Japanese media defined uh, the dark fantasy genre and its tropes and its aesthetic. You know, dark fantasy when you see it. I, I think a lot of uh, Western audiences would pro would quantify uh, Game of Thrones as that. Uh, the TV show in particular, it's got a lot of the the aesthetic is a lot of like mud and grime. I think also a really important thing that is that is something that Berserk is. Literally, it's the first page. An important element of dark fantasy is that it's tr it's inherently transgressive. Like mm -hmm. it's meant to unsettle you. It's meant to take you out of your comfort zone. Yeah, that's actually a really good way of of spotting something that is has a dark fantasy coat of paint on it. Uh, if it has the dark fantasy like visual aesthetic, if it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable through the characters. You know, because I mean, the first the first thing that you see in or like uh, or uncomfortable in general, because the first thing you see in Berserk is a, a fully on panel sex scene. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> guts and a demon. There's this sort of there's this sort of sense of this is not a safe space. Mm -hmm. It is it is confrontational. It is very direct. Yeah, that sort of uh, lo looming presence that any moment could turn dangerous. And, and most of them do. And most of them do, yes. Like, contrast the uh, the tavern of, like, a more optimistic fantasy series versus the tavern in a dark fantasy series. Well, you know, <laughs> comedically, uh, like, to, to the most possible extreme, look at the tavern in Konosuba versus the, uh, any given tavern in Berserk. Uh, like, exactly. <laughs> if you transplanted any character from either of those series into the other, it'd be a bloodbath. They'd be so hideously out of place. And that's why uh, the Elden Ring manga is an interesting example, because as as the latest from software game, it is uh, the uh, and the, uh, specifically the latest one from Hidetaka Miyazaki. It is. The latest in a long string of dark fantasy all uh, spawned from uh, the influence of Berserk. Yeah, it, uh, Elden Ring started off as a child of Berserk, you know, and in a lot of ways, the comedy of the Elden Ring manga almost directly comes from the idea that Elden Ring is inherently dark fantasy because like obtaining power is a bad thing. It does curse you like it w like it would in a proper dark fantasy, except it curses you with miserable inconvenience rather than like a fate worse than death. It curses you to have to deal with weirdos like Blythe, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like you keep waiting for the other shoe to drop and, you know, it ends in a punchline as opposed to 
a line of punches. Uh, Berserk, on the other hand, like Berserk proper is you you wait for it to get worse and then it does and then it does again. And it actually does it a third time just to really knee in the balls. The sort of like natural vulnerability of uh, the characters in uh, a dark fantasy, you know, it, it, and, I it think, get... and I th- you pointed out the like the iconic first images, uh, first few pages of Berserk in that regard, Jake. And I think that is a great example of that because, well, for one, it has the benefit of our hero being c- completely naked, <laughs> not even metaphorically naked and vulnerable, just literally naked and vulnerable. And uh, it, You know, not to put too fine a point on it, but when participating in the boning, there are many sensitive bits that are exposed. Yeah. (laughs) And that demon sure does look pointy. (laughs) And yet the weird metal arm turns into a cannon, (laughs) which is further symbolism of how, despite the vulnerability, one must always be ready to ball. Yeah. Yeah. To cannonball in this case. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Guts is such a good dark fantasy protagonist because he has the power to wreck your shit. And yet it is a dark fantasy because despite the fact that he has all of this power, despite the fact that we see him in a pretty like dominant and almost safe place in the beginning, he gets Mm -hmm. his ass kicked a lot. Mm -hmm. He gets he gets brutalized regularly and there's this sort of uh, sense of no matter how powerful you get, there is a horror like w- lurking around the corner and there's about a 40% chance that you are going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that eternal tug of war between uh, the, between the tension of danger and the natural sort of, progression of power that comes from a linear story because one of the one of the things that is sort of universal i say sort of universal but extremely prevalent in storytelling is that as the story progresses in 90 percent of cases your hero will become more capable of dealing what is dealing with what is going on that is why escalating stakes are so important one of the signs of good dark fantasy as expressed by uh, both Berserk and Elden Ring, even the manga, is that whatever level of competency you obtain, it's still going to be just barely enough to survive whatever comes next. Well, I, I think it I think it goes a layer deeper because uh, the real tableau of it is you have just barely enough to survive what's right in front of you. Mm hmm. And with the knowledge that whatever comes next will be worse. Uh, You just got to hope that in overcoming this challenge, it will grant you some new power that you can use against whatever comes next, because if it doesn't, and in a lot of cases, it just doesn't. You're doomed. You you are uh, walking right into a fate worse than death. So we've completely failed in talking about more upbeat topics. (laughs) Let us continue to do so and talk about romance through the lens of Call of the Night. (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I think the big thing when it comes to uh, romance and and something expressed specifically by Call of the Night is this kind of goes into a little bit an element of dark fantasy, because one good way of killing a dark fantasy is making your character too competent in Mm. a romance you want to have the romance not be healthy. You want it to be not okay. Because if the romance is okay, then there is no story. Yes. But you in, also... In fact, coming back to Kaguya-sama, that is played up to the benefit of comedy. Whereas right. in Call of the Night, it is... Uh, it, also comedy. Well... <laughs> buildings in, from a, on, in, a bit of a, in a bit of a bleak sense, yeah. <laughs> but she ain't wrong. Um, but, um, the, the sort of important balance is, uh, you want to make the relationship unhealthy enough to make an interesting story, but not so unhealthy that, you know, the, the reader in the case of a manga isn't invested in it. You know, mm-hmm. you gotta want these crazy kids to get together, you know, in the end. Uh, if, you if got- it's so blatantly unhealthy that it shatters on impact. 
it's not yeah. gonna work you know and i mean like there is there is a sense where you could have a dark romance where like the point of it is it's not gonna end happy mm-hmm. um but you know something like call of the night i think treads the line very well and honestly kaguya-sama as well uh treads the line very well where you can see a path to being in a healthy place but you can also see that it's going to be a long hard journey that the characters are not going to take a linear path on you know Mm -hmm. um so you know what's a really good anime about an incredibly unhealthy relationship uh scum's wish is an amazing like 12 episode thing about these two teenagers who are both in love with adults and they realize they can never be in an actual relationship with them so they settle for each other as a (laughs) way of getting those adults jealous of them and it's just such a train wreck and it's amazing Um, that that sounds like an incredible train wreck oh i don't suppose it has a manga maybe if it does, you might see it appear on our uh, schedule at some point, dear listener. Hold on. Yes, it does. Hell yeah! <laughs> Let's do it. I could stand for some suffering. Like I said, I've been watching Gundam. <laughs> ah, which for Mercury. So uh, the sort of important element is you have to see a path for um, uh, for the characters to uh, get to a healthy place. And in Call of the Night, you know, you have a character who has pretty, pretty like it's not been delved into the specifics yet, but pretty explicit trust issues and a character who has a problem uh, uh, sort of internalizing intimacy. And it's like. Those are hard problems to overcome, but they can be overcome. So there's a chance that they might be able to make this work. And like a lot of romance, like you know, a lot of like capital R romance, uh, you know, will have at least some kind of happy ending. But I think another kind of cool thing about uh, romance is um, it sort of has that uh, sports uh, genre element where it could just blow up. They could just not get together in the end. That's not the fate of the world at stake. The main character of Call of the Night, um, he could just move on with his life at some point and that could he be could just become end. diurnal at some point because you see a path towards health you see a path towards the ending you want the fact that that very reasonably can be taken away from you is one of the things that keeps a uh like a romance compelling and call the night really loves to play with that better than worse than better than worse but it <laughs> Let's be real. It 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 likes diving way more into the worse than the better. <laughs> it, it it is interesting in the sense where, um, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, like the the characters will like give into the worst angels of their nature, but they're also they're also very very overtly not bad people, which I think mm-hmm. is a big part of the thing that keeps them uh like like keeps you rooting for them to figure it out. Both of the main characters worst. In that bad, you know, Mm -hmm. and it keeps them it keeps them relatable and uh, um, endearing. Looking at Kage-sama, it's it's the same thing. It's like they're they're idiots, but they're endearing idiots and they could be healthy together if they would just communicate. And this has been a lot of discussion about the vulnerability of characters, either physically in uh, in the case of horror or dark fantasy. Mm, and emotionally in terms of romance but what if what if you were just a badass ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now let's talk about subversion uh, about subverting that <laughs> boy uh uh two series we've uh uh done uh, quite a bit on uh-huh um it is sort of interesting when you see a series like actively choosing to either um go all in with a genre's tropes or to shy away from them because one of the things that was the most compelling about demon slayer as a series early on was the fact that they didn't do something that is one of the standard buy-ins of shonen which is because the because it's a battle series with superpowers, you know, it's like people can conjure fire. If someone throws a fireball at your face, you're probably going to die 
in the real world. It doesn't matter how many push-ups you've done, how many pull-ups you've done, how much juice you drank. You're probably going to die from a baseball-sized ball of flame smacking you in the face. You know, Shonen is like about how the conflict develops over time, uh, both in terms of like an individual fight, you know, the any, you know, like the puzzle box aspect of it or how characters grow and develop over time. The lethality of Shonen is naturally low so that you can get big, uh, big set piece moments. And, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, there are cases where certain Shonen genres, Dragon Ball, Hiroaka, you know, it's like there are excuses you could give where it's like everyone has a low, uh, like a like a low level uh, invulnerability quirk in addition mm. to whatever else they have or how Dragon Ball, it's like the 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 chi is like, you know, protecting their bodies from the impact of, you know, getting slammed through a mountain or something like that. But mm-hmm. like at the end of the day, it's simply how did, the- how did Sonic survive getting thrown by that Titan through like three pillars <laughs> had a bunch of extra rings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and what it comes down to ultimately is that um, uh, Shonen is just a inherently lower lethality series because Shonen benefits from one of the most uh, powerful uh one of the most powerful and most prolific uh, things about uh, action heavy things. And that is the set piece. In my opinion, all of the best shonen that you can list has more to say than simply just being a cool aesthetic. But Mm -hmm. one of the core appeals of shonen is the hype moment. Yeah. When you're looking up, you know, clips from dragon ball or in in these cases hiroaka and demon slayer you're not looking up uh that moment that well okay you might be looking up that moment they had a quiet conversation because <laughs> damn that needs to happen more <laughs> but the ones that have the most views on youtube are the uh you know climactic final moment of the epic battle or you know the ghost super saiyan moment or the the sakuga the the moment the sawano drop happens yeah it's one of those cases where like Demon Slayer early on, it actively and successfully subverted that it justified the characters being more vulnerable than the average shonen, but it kind of fell into the uh, into the tropes of its own genre a little bit where in service to a set piece, they sort of decided that Inosuke can move his organs <laughs> or is, it, <laughs> is invulnerable to poison. Uh, you know. he, he is built so incredibly differently. But and like, if they just opened with that, it'd be fine. Because, again, one of the big things is and a thing that we've talked about a lot with all these different genres is the way they affect audience buy-in. Mm. And in shonen, the in in action heavy stuff uh, or just action in general, the buy-in has to involve the idea that the participants have some level of just superhuman durability. You know, uh, gravity only works in Spider-Man when it gets uh, Gwen Stacy's neck broken. Yeah. Is a famous example. So being stabbed only works when or being stabbed only doesn't work when you can <laughs> move your organs out of the way because we're not going to kill this character off. Because of because of the nature and the context of the Gwen Stacy scene, You know, people will joke about gravity only matters in Spider-Man then. But like that doesn't take away from the fact that the death of Gwen Stacy is a legitimately powerful moment from the Spider-Man mythos. But that's because it's not breaking the fiction of, you know, I mean, like the superhero genre is, you know, honestly, I would say the Western equivalent of the shonen genre in a lot of ways. That moment, that moment was about, you know, consequent uh, consequences catching up with uh, the protagonist. You know, that's why suddenly gravity mattered. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it doesn't affect the buy in of, you know, this is a world with superheroes and it doesn't affect Hiroaka, which is a superhero shonen genre sort of going to my point from before. You just kind of assume that someone can get thrown through a building and they'll be okay. 
Like mm-hmm. when it happens, it that's despite not despite how much Deku's bones break. If he gets <laughs> thrown into a concrete wall and his bones don't break, I'm like, yeah, okay. And it, it's one of those ones where it doesn't set off the ding plot hole moment. But Demon Slayer had originally established itself as not following that rule. Mm-hmm. You know, when someone gets cut, they get cut. And it's that going against the grain but then slowly starting to fall back in line is why that hurt Demon Slayer, you know? Mm-hmm. Let's, let's be honest here. Demon Slayer doesn't do anything slowly. <laughs> it snapped yeah. back in line. Look, I, I want to do a discussion episode at some point about story pacing, <laughs> and Demon Slayer is a not inconsiderable reason why. <laughs> well, let's finish with Demon Slayer first, because... <laughs> That might take a bit at our current pace, but <laughs> this this is all to say that genre is a cat- uh, as a categorization tool is very efficient when it comes to setting expectations and perhaps more efficient when it commits to the when the media in question commits to the bit of subverting it. Yeah, if if you are going to be that special snowflake insert genre here. If you subvert a a trope of the genre, you'd better stick with it through the entire thing, because if you don't, people will suddenly notice all of the cases where that rule isn't followed. Why wasn't it like this before? Yeah. Uh, Also is, you know, kind of the uh, power of genre, because there are so many genres. If you come at it, if you, you know, like if you look at, you know, a horror series from a shonen perspective, it makes a horror series look bad and vice versa. Mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, the level of vulnerability of characters, the uh, the core themes present um, and and indeed, uh, you know, that that last layer on top of the aesthetic, you know, the way it looks. Um, uh, they they allow the audience to experience a story at a reasonable pace so that you don't have to explain everything in exhaustive detail um i I think uh this serves as a uh, decent wrap point for our discussion uh final thoughts i mean jake and i've kind of given ours so uh matt (laughs) genre is dumb it's descriptive not prescriptive and i disagree with everything not even pertaining to this discussion, just any opinion you have, I disagree with it. <laughs> uh, Matt, Matt the Contrarian strikes again. And thank you, everyone, once again for listening to the Over Manga Cast. As always, you can find us on all of your social medias where we are at Over Manga Cast. And um, where the hell else are we? <laughs> uh, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, the episodes are on a two week delay, but there you can like, comment and subscribe. Uh, on uh, overmangacast.com. Uh, we have everything up to date. You can also leave comments for us there. Including suggestions on what to read. We love hearing from you guys, and uh, we've gotten a lot of really good episodes out of uh, user suggestions, even the ones that get rescinded. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, if you feel like you enjoyed this episode, go ahead, leave us a review. They really help out. Um, pod chaser uh itunes wherever just give us a nice uh, star rating that you think we deserve and we love hearing written reviews so go ahead with those and if you want to reach out to us directly you can always do so uh over email at overmangacast at gmail.com talk about either way see you next thursday good night everybody good night everybody i don't even know why i do these oh shit it's still recording <laughs> Cut!